Namibia, a vast, sparsely populated country in the southwest of the African continent. It is twice as large as Germany, but has only two million inhabitants. Namibia is a piece of German history. Only 30 years took the period of the German colony at the end of the 19th century, but the past and the German language are still alive everywhere. Above all, Namibia is a great part of Africa, with spectacular scenery and its wildlife is second to none. It's nearly a 10 hours flight from the German summer to the southwest African winter. The airport of Windhoek lies alone in the desert, 40 kilometers from the capital. Mid 19th century, the area was inhabited by a tribe of the Nama. They built under their chief, Yonka Afrikaner, with a huge contingent of workers a road from Windhoek to Walwis Bay, Namibia's only protected harbour. The old Bai Way soon became the most important trade route and of missionaries, business people and colonizers alike used to tap the central highlands. The first witness of the colonial past is left by the wayside. The once magnificent villa of the director of the German Farm Society Liebig is for 50 years a haunted house. The first Germans came in 1883 when the Bremen merchant Adolf Luderitz acquired a large coastal area of the Nama and immediately demanded the protection of the German Reich for his property. Five years after the colony was manifested with the arrival of the late governor Kurt von Francois and its protective force of 21 men. He built the four Wilhelms Feste in Sao Obis as base. Today's Zaobis Leopard Farm was established by the Swiss physician Dr. August Juchli years ago as an orphanage for predators. The kids of yesterday have grown up and had to change their playroom in the living room to places on the large farm paddocks. Shortly after our stay there, the farm was sadly closed. In Namibia, only a few main roads are paved, the rest are gravel roads. They are usually in good condition, so you can drive quite well with a robust car. Driving with an SUV is of course more relaxed. In combination with roof tents, it is the ideal vehicle to travel this country. The animals in Namibia have consistently different dimensions than ours in Europe. These African giant crickets measure more than 10 centimeters and are armored like medieval knights. In addition to the nature, Namibia's wells lies in its mineral resources. In the summer of 98, a train maid found the first diamond. This led to a treasure hunt of unimaginable proportions. The reduction was simple. The stones only had to be picked up from the ground. Gems for less budget can be found within 50 kilometers at the little town of Karibib, 
on the paved main road from Windhoek to Swakopmund. After a few kilometers on this road, we once again turned heading north. Our goal is the Amaip Ranch. Located on the edge of the Irongo Mountains, it offers a landscape like a picture book. Huge sanded granite balls are scattered around the grounds. You cannot see that the funny desis are the closest biological relatives to the elephants. In the evening at the campsite, there are onlookers to touch. And the kinder had so by the tour room in, by the beine room gespielt. And he had gar nichts so gemacht. Come, nicht, nicht mit mir. Siehst du, da ist der jetzt ruhig. Jo, holt sie da. Guck da. Macht der nichts. The next morning, the daily dozen has to be done. The owners of the ranch have created a via ferrata at the so-called elephant's head, on which we climb towards the summit. After half an hour, we are on the top and enjoy the view. The descent is unspectacular. On the flat side of the mountain, a comfortable way leads down to the valley. Below, surprisingly, we found ourselves in an open-air museum. On the farm, there are numerous rock paintings dating back to the Bushmen. However, they are often isolated and difficult to access. To provide an insight to the guests, an African artist has copied these drawings here on the rock wall.
the Namibian farms convey at first glance a touch of large estates. In fact, they usually have an extension as a German county. This quantity is, however, vital to a farm in the arid plains of Africa because of the barren soil and lack of water, there's not much food for the animals. Another well-marked trail on Amaib leads us to the Phillips Cave. There are original rock paintings, signed and sealed. The White Elephant is the most famous work of art on the farm. Across the villages Omaruru and Ochivarongo, we return to the central plateau. Our goal is the historic Waterberg, which marks one of the darkest episodes of German colonial rule. The Waterberg Plateau is a national park and you should arrive there before sunset, because then the doors are closed and you must stay outside. Like a red wall rises the table mountain of eroded sandstone from the flat surrounding countryside. Around the camp are several small hikes. However, most impressive is the climb to the plateau. This comrade is called Fimoril Pachilumera and comes from the family of scarab beetles. The stony lane leads along the rock walls. When you reach the edge, you'll get a panoramic view of the vast plateau. In the camp, other visitors has arrived. The doika is one of the smallest antelopes in Africa. They are just as high as our knees. The night was cool, but the sun moves the Waterberg already into the right light. For a first warm-up, a treetop is the right place. On the resort lies the old cemetery of the German colonial forces. In January 94, the Nama and the Herero stood up against the permanent penetration of the colonists. Six months later, the uprising was bloodily suppressed at the Battle of Waterberg. The surviving Herero and their families have been pushed into the waterless desert Omaheke by the protection force. There, the majority of the 75,000 Hereros died of thirst.
on narrow pads. That's how they call the unpaved trails to the trip continues. The roads are leading to farm areas and often gates have to be opened and after the passage to be closed again. The next attraction is not out of this world. We are facing the largest meteorite found on Earth. The 50-ton boulder was discovered in 1920 while plowing on the Hobar farm and exposed and described by the scientist Jacobus Hermanus Britz. In 1955, it was declared a national monument. Meanwhile, the area is fenced and the boulder protected from souvenir hunters. The little picnic area on the side is a good point to have lunch before the journey continues towards Ochikoto Lake. The lake is located near the town of Tsumeb in a small park with all kinds of art and kitsch. This one and the 15 km distant Guinya Lake are the only two continuous water-bearing lakes in Namibia. Ochikoto in the Herero language means deep hole. It is a water-filled, vertically falling sinkhole. During the First World War, the German colonial forces sank various arms in the 76-meter-deep lake, which have not yet been recovered. We arrive in the evening at the guest farm Sachsenheim near the junction in the Itosha National Park and setting up ourselves a small campsite for the night. The Itosha National Park is definitely a highlight of any trip to Namibia. It has an area of the size of Hesse and surrounds a 5,000 km salt pan. The name comes from the Oshivambo language and means Great White Place. We enter the park through the gate of Lindequist in the east and arrive after a short drive at the historic Fort Namutoni. It was built in 897 by the Germans and marked the northern boundary of the colony. The local Ovambo tribe was counted peaceful, so most of the crew was sent to the southern war zone during the Herero rebellion. Seven people were left behind as guards, 
who were suddenly standing in front of an army of 500 Ovambo warriors. But they could fight back the first assault and fleeing at night to the 100 km away Fort Sumeb. With the establishment of the national park, the dilapidated fort was rebuilt and was used by the park authority since 1957. Today, it is one of the three official camps in the national park and offers camping and lodge. Who does not feel for safari only has to sit by the local waterhole and to wait until the fauna of Africa appears. For example, Oryx, the heraldic animals of Namibia. A black-backed jackal. It feeds on carrion and small animals, but also takes pleasure off in front of the tents parked sneakers at night. The wildebeest is part of the hartebeest and a common steppe inhabitant. We are lucky to hit a group of lions. Also at Itosha Park, you can face the largest predator in Africa every day. However, the plain zebras are present in large numbers in the park. With up to 6 meters, the giraffe is the tallest living land animal on Earth. Her neck is unusually long, but has only 7 cervicals as usual in mammals. It allows them to get through the fresh leaves in the canopy of acacia trees. They are pulling the leaves with their 50 cm long tongue from the branches. About 30 kilograms of food is needed by each giraffe daily. Of which its liquid needs it's largely covered so that it can survive for weeks without drinking. This is a good thing. Because of this long legs for the giraffe, the water absorption of lakes is an acrobatic effort.
In the eastern, accessible portion of the park, there are 29 natural water bodies, which are completed by 12 artificial. Mostly, these are artesian fountains where water is flushed under pressure to the surface. By late afternoon, we reach our next camp in the national park with a resounding name, Halali. When the dawn breaks, a very odd, tense atmosphere develops at the water points. You can feel the silence. By and by, the night visitors peel out of the darkness to quench their thirst at the water, always on guard against enemies. In order to film the animals at all, we have to use the long-term exposure of the camera. A black reno. And here's a scout for the next heavyweight division. Only a few meters downhill, we see the grey giant. No fence separates the spectators from the animals. The two hyenas cannot impress the elephant at all. It signals green light for the rest of the drove.
Later arrives a lone bull who obviously has nothing to do with the extended family. Outside the camps, it is strongly forbidden to leave the vehicle. An exception is made only for the few rest areas, which are usually protected by a fence. Here you can picnic or discharge urgent needs. Although this toilet is quite classy. Wildebeest and zebra are often found in peaceful neighborhood. After about 70 kilometers, we reach the camp Okakueyo with its prominent round tower. Like Namutoni, Okakueyo was founded as a military post at the end of the 19th century. Although there was a tower at that time, today's was only built in 1963. From the bungalows you have a good view of the standpost where's the hustle and bustle. The chipmunks speculate on food and do not show fear of the guests. A colony of weavers have settled in the campsite. The branches do not cope the unbridled expansion of their homes permanently. The Cory Bustard reaches a height of 1 meter and 30 and weighs 5 to 19 kilograms. This makes it the largest and heaviest flying bird in Africa. At the western end of the accessible park area, you'll find the so-called fairy tale forest. The Moringa trees, however, do appear more spooky than fabulous.
On the well-built asphalt road, we leaving Itosha and travel via O2 into Damara land. The dry rivers in Namibia, which only carry water from time to time, are called Riviere. One of the biggest is the Ugab, with 450 km lengths. In prehistoric times, when he let plenty of water, these striking mesas have been formed by erosion in his bed. The smallest and most bizarre of these is the Winger Clip. The spire is 35 meters high with a circumference at the base of 44 meters. With invisible range, there is an oasis in the desert, the Wingercliff Lodge. Even if you do not want to stay there, it's worth a visit because you'll get good coffee and cake. West of Kurixas, the last significant place for the next 470 kilometers, begins the petrified forest. The wild scattered trees were washed by rivers into this area 300 million years ago. Buried under sand airtight, due to the penetration of silica they have turned to stone over the time. In the evening, we finally reach the desert camp in the valley of Aba Huab. Before we continue our journey to the skeleton coast, we make a little trip to Zweifelfontein and to the Verbrandeberg. The area was called Doubtful Source by the farmer when they settled there in 1947. Cause the local source of water supply was proven to be unreliable. Already in 1964 the farm operation was given up again. There remained only a few ruins of the buildings. However, nearby, they have found 2,500 rock engravings and some petroglyphs. For this reason, Twyfelfontein is named as a World Cultural Heritage on the UNESCO list since 2007. The age of the engravings is difficult to determine. The first ones were probably around 300 BC and the last about 1800. Animal bones which have been handed as well as some more tools, which they were using as their knives. And the reason for the Bushmen to go to the sea was collecting some salt for cooking and then to preserve the meat against the flies. How they were using their necks in different ways. 
is that the ostriches were using their necks up in the between the rocks grows the Namibian Edelweiss. On top of the rhinos, there we have got the human footprint. In the middle, that's a zebra. Behind the zebra, we got the ostrich. And to the left hand side, there we have got still some more giraffes. About 10 kilometers from Twyfelfontein are somewhat hidden the organ pipes. These are a 100 million year old basalt columns that reach a height of up to 5 meters. After another kilometer, we are reaching the Burnt Mountain. It was formed 80 million years ago by a cooled lava flow and stands out clearly from the surrounding area with its brown-violet color. Through the wild, untouched landscape of the Damara land, we head towards the coastal plain. After 100 kilometers, you will reach the gateway to the Skeleton Coast National Park. The Welwitschia mirabilis is the most famous plant in Namibia and can be up to 2,000 years old. Those who expect a village at Tora Bay at the Skeleton Coast will be disappointed. It is a lonely camp for avid anglers, which is open only in the local summer months of December and January. For the rest of the year, it is owned by the Cormorans of the Water Tower. The skeleton coast is dry and inhospitable, but it has a large variety of species. In addition to numerous birds such as flamingos, there are eared seals, jackals, hyenas, lions and the rare Namibian desert elephant. For sailors, this coast has always been notorious. Dense fog, caused by the cold Benguela current from Antarctica, and treacherous currents brought countless ships to the shore. Those who survived the accident had to die of thirst in the waterless outback inevitably.
Through the picturesque gate, we leave the National Park Thaus again. About 30 kilometers further, the campsite with the telling name Mile 108 invites to stay overnight. Outside of the summer fishing season, you have no problems finding available campsite. In January 4086, the Portuguese explorer Diogo Cao entered at Cape Cross, probably at the first European Namibia's coast. He put on a padrao, a stone cross with an inscription to take the land for his king in possession. The original was brought to Berlin in 1893, but a replica still reminds of the Portuguese sailor. The real attraction of the Cross Cape is the huge colony of South African fur seals, which belong to the breed of eared seals. Up to 250,000 animals abound on the rocky coast and are not to be missed. In October and November, they bring their hatchlings. The pup mortality is quite high. Among their enemies are especially hyenas and jackals.
The asphalt on the coast road is in fact a compost of a layer of salt. When it's foggy, it can be slippery. Salt pools are also found between road and beach and if necessary, you can fill a small store here. In Hunters Bay, civilization is reached again. The former camp from the 50s has now grown into a nice village. Now, there are only about 70 kilometers to Swakopmund, Namibia's main tourist destination. The German influence is unmistakable in the city. Kurt von Francois founded the village at the mouth of the Swakop River on the 12th of September 1892. It was to serve the German settlers as a supply port because the 30 kilometers south more appropriate natural port of Walwis Bay was under British administration. The pier is called Chetty by the locals. Its construction was started in 1902 to facilitate larger ships to clear the cargo. In 1912, the former construction made of wood was replaced by a steely pier. Today, Swakopmund thrives on tourism. Many Namibians refuge in the hot summer month here out of the highlands, where temperatures due to the coastal fog is significantly lower. Foreign tourists are fascinated by the mixture of North Seaside Resort, African population and desert landscape. We recommend a visit to the Crystal Gallery. The world's largest conglomerate found in quartz crystals is standing at the entrance hall and weighs 14 tons. The exhibition provides a comprehensive overview of the Namibian minerals. At Walwis Bay, we leave the coast and drive to the Namib Naukluft National Park. One of the most decorative plants in southern Namibia is the quiver tree. It belongs to the genus of Aloes and can reach heights up to 9 meters. The yellow bark is paper thin and let the trees glow in the twilight. The Bushmen are using the hollow branches as quivers, hence the name.
The Kuisep Canyon is a winding canyon system. Long after drying up the river, you can still see many standpipes. The geologists Henno Martin and Hermann Kahn took this at advantage during the Second World War when the mandatory power South Africa put a lot of Namibians of German descent in internment camps. In their book, If There is War, We Go to the Desert, they are describing how they spent two and a half years here on their own, beating the war with a trick. In the riverbed of the Kuiseb, we meet old friends. Apparently, the giant crickets are assessed cannibalistic and eat their own kind who went to the docks. A little vicious circle, because many are overtaken by the same fate. Perhaps a vegetarian diet might be a better choice. After a quiet, lonely night away from the road, we continue our journey the next morning. The passes in Namibia do not necessarily lead to the mountain range. Often they represent only a transition between plateau and lowlands or a ravine crossing, as for example in the Gaub Pass. After 220 kilometers from Walwis Bay through the desert, we are getting back to a village, if you would like to call the gas station of Solitaire a village. An opportunity for a coffee and delicious apple cake. Sesrim Canyon is up to 30 meters deep, but sometimes only 2 meters wide from above. It is difficult to realize. Over the last 2 million years, it has been carved into the sedimentary rock by the Tsauchab Revier. Down below, there is a permanent water source. 
Sesrim is Afrikaans and means six belts that the settlers had to tie together to draw water from the canyon by the time. The state Sesserim camp is the gateway to the Namib desert. Because of the difficult water supply, there are only 25 places. An expensive alternative is the nearby Sossusflay Lodge. The afternoon is the best time for a tour into the Namib, as the red dunes glow in the morning and evening hours at its best. 45 kilometers from the camp you can reach the Dune 45. It is next to the road and ideal for a first climb. The outer gate to the Sesrim camp is the national park closes at sunset. The guests of the campground have an hour longer to return to the camp so they can fully enjoy the evening in the desert. A morning at a sold-out camping in Namibia. The winter nights are cold in the desert, proven by a layer of frost on the tent roof. In contrast, the Elim dune near the campsite shines in the warm light of the morning sun in all colors. <laughs> no. <laughs> on the way to Sossusflay, we come across an ostrich family. The well-maintained asphalt road follows the Zauschab Dry River, whose course is occasionally marked by trees. At the end of the constructed road, 
you can experience the desert firsthand on walks through the dunes. It's amazing green plants sprouting everywhere. Our footprints in the sand are obliterated in a short time by the constantly blowing wind. In the Namib are the highest dunes in the world. They protrude up to 220 meters over the sand sea. Normal passenger cars cannot handle the last four kilometers from the end of the paved road to the Fleece. For the deep sandy track, you need a SUV and good nerves, or you ride one of the four-wheel driven shuttles that are running on the track. The flays in the Namib are salt clay pans, which came to existence by the silting of the river Tsaushap. Originally, it flowed further into the 15 kilometers away Atlantic until his pass was blocked by the wandering dunes. Since then, it ends here in the desert. Even the dead flay can't be reached by the Tsaushap now. Because of the drought, the dead trees are degenerating very slowly. A kilometer further, the dirt road ends in the parking lot of the Sossos Flay. And here we are getting a big surprise. A lake in the desert, 65 kilometers from the nearest waterhole. This natural phenomenon occurs on average only every 10 years after long and extensive rainfall when the Tsaushap brings enough water to fill the Sossos Flay. Later, we will get informed that it rained in the highlands during the previous month that much has not seen for decades. This also explains why the Namib this time is much more green than on our previous visits.
With up to 22% of gradient, the Spritz Hochtepass is one of the steepest in Namibia. Because it's a gravel road, you should drive the east-west direction down to the coastal plain only with good brakes and walking speed. The steepest section, however, has been diffused with asphalt by now. One more night on the farm Namibgrenz, then we come closer to Windhoek and unfortunately to the end of our two-week trip. This visit will not be our last in one of the most beautiful countries in Africa. Mm -hmm.